It is more important than ever to be prepared for your technical interviews these days, given how competitive the job market is, especially at the junior level. The last thing you want is to be overwhelmed by all the things that you need to know in order to prepare for your interview. So in this video, I've compiled a list of six questions that I've noticed come up again and again, so you can focus on the 20% that come up 80% of the time. These are targeted towards more juniors and intermediates, but it's really a good refresher for people at any level especially if it's been years since you've interviewed and you're a little rusty. Let's get into it. First question, explain the JavaScript event loop. This is a very common question that gets asked over and over again because it really tests your understanding of what is going on under the hood. In simple terms, the JavaScript event loop allows JavaScript to handle multiple tasks at a time, even though JavaScript itself is single threaded. This is important because if we had to handle slow processes like network requests synchronously, it would block the main thread and the browser would essentially be unres unresponsive during that time. I found this great demo created by Philip Roberts who did the famous talk on the event loop several years ago to show you how it works. Each time a function is called, it gets pushed onto the call stack. When it's finished running, it gets pushed off the call stack. For asynchronous functions that take a bit of a longer time like network requests and set timeout, JavaScript is going to offload that into the web APIs, which lives in the browser. When those tasks are done, they're placed in what is known as the callback queue. The event loop is constantly checking to see if the call stack is empty. When the call stack is empty, it then pushes the first task from the callback queue onto the call stack. And this is also why when you call set timeout with zero milliseconds as the second argument, it's going to wait until all the other functions have run and the call stack is empty before it runs the callback function inside of set timeout. What is a closure and can you provide an example? In very simple terms, a JavaScript closure is when a function remembers the environment in which it was created, even after that environment has has finished executing. Imagine if as a kid, you used to go to this ice cream store and then that ice cream store had to shut down, but you can still remember all the flavors that they served. The other kids though, they won't remember those flavors because they never went when it was open and now the place is shut down. That might actually be the craziest analogy of a JavaScript closure. So let's take a look at an example. If you take a look at this code snippet, the count variable is only available inside create counter because it is defined within create counters local scope. Because we've defined and returned an inner function though, we've created a closure. This inner function that's been returned can still access the count variable even after create counter has finished running. This is useful because we can keep the count variable private, we can limit and control the access to the count variable by only allowing the inner function to modify it. You can't just directly change the count variable from outside of the inner function. In JavaScript, this is a way in which we can encapsulate data. Next, what is hoisting? Hoisting in the world of JavaScript refers to how the JavaScript engine hoists or moves the variable declarations to the top of their scope. I put hoists and moves in quotes because the code doesn't physically move, but we can think of it that way to understand it better. In reality, the JavaScript engine sets up memory space so that we can use the variables before they're actually written. This is a basic TLDR of how JavaScript hoists variables and functions. Using a variable initialized with the var keyword before it's written will result in a defined. And yes, I know it's 2024, you should not be initializing and declaring variables using var. Using a let or const variable before it's written will result in a reference error. Function declarations will be usable before it's written. However, function expressions are not because function expressions behave like regular variables. In real life and day-to-day -day coding, we should always be declaring and initializing variables at the top of their scope so we don't need to mentally keep track of which ones are available and which ones are not. So to be completely transparent, I don't feel like this concept is super useful for day-to-day -day on the job, but 
you're going to be asked this in an interview, so it's good to be aware. By the way, if you're looking to seriously improve your coding skills, I highly recommend checking out Scrimba. Unlike other courses or tutorials on the internet where you're just passively watching videos, Scrimba does it differently. They completely reinvented the screencast for coding. They call these scrims, which magically combine the code editor and lesson recording into one. So anytime you can jump directly into the teacher's code and change it, you don't need to spend any time setting up your local environment and your coding right away. It almost feels like you're pair programming with your instructor. This is critical because I'm someone who learns by doing. They regularly prompt you to solve challenges inside the lessons and work on building real world projects so you can actually test and expand on what you've learned. They've got a wide range of courses from advanced JavaScript to artificial intelligence and an entire front end developer career path co-created with Mozilla MDN. It includes a whole section on acing the interview and is designed to take you from zero to fully hireable. I have personally used Scrimba a few years ago when I started a new job and I wanted to brush up on my React skills. Don't just listen to me though. They've also got amazing reviews on Reddit. They've also got a ton of free courses, so go check them out if you want to fast track your learning and thank you Scrimba for sponsoring this video. Question number four, what is the purpose of anonymous functions? There are times when you need to pass in a function as an argument, but you don't need to reuse that function anywhere else in the code. So writing that function in line could make the code more concise. A very common example is the argument we pass into JavaScript's array methods such as filter or map. We need to pass in a function to describe how we want the array to be filtered but we don't need to reuse this function anywhere else in our code base. So it's much easier to read and cleaner to just pass in an anonymous function. This way we can clearly see what the callback function is rather than go searching for that named function somewhere else in the code base. Anonymous functions are most commonly used in higher order functions, event handling, and callbacks. Next question, explain and apply debounds. This is a really popular interview question because it tests your application and knowledge of tricky concepts like closures and higher order functions. It's probably not going to be enough to know what debounce is, but they're going to ask you how to apply it as a coding challenge. Essentially, debounce is a technique used to reduce the number of times a function is called. For example, if someone is searching for an account on a social media app, it's expensive and unnecessary to make an API request at every keystroke. A better approach would be to wait a certain amount of time for them to finish typing before sending off that request. In this example, I have a callback function that is triggered when a user types into the input box. My callback function is to simply print whatever they typed onto the screen, but you can imagine that this is some expensive API call that makes a database query. Rather than running that callback function at every keystroke, I'll wait half a second or whatever when the user is likely done typing before sending off that request. Other examples where debounce is useful are form validation, multiple clicks on buttons, window resizing, and other user interactions. Basically, we want to wait a certain amount of time until the user is likely done before sending off that search query or validating their form input. For a really good in-depth explanation on how to implement debounce, check out this video. Question number six. How would you handle errors in an asynchronous function that uses async await? Chances are you will be asked a few questions on handling asynchronous operations during your front end interview. So be sure to be very familiar with async await, promises, making API calls, etc. You might be asked to write a request to an external API or refactor a function that is currently using promises into using async await. In our case, Handling errors gracefully simply means wrapping your asynchronous code into a try catch. For example, if I'm making a call using fetch, I would wrap that part into a try catch as shown in this code example. Any errors that happen while making that call will fall into the catch block where I can handle that error any way I want. That's it for today, but if you've enjoyed this video, I have a playlist featuring other JavaScript interview questions and answer in a similar format, which I'll link at the end of this video. So be sure to check that out and I'll see you over there. Bye-bye.